I think back in those years, I was 23, 24 years old. So I had a little bit of an attitude, probably. Had? (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Book Therapy. I'm your host, Kim Patton. There's no way to count how many books are floating around in this world. Some are decent, some are truly terrible, and some are great. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into one great book. Together, we will discover gems of truth and encouragement to help you face your current season of life. I'm ready. You're ready. Let's get this party started. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Book Therapy. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. I'm not in charge, so that will be fun. But also, my book, Nothing Wasted, Struggling Well Through Difficult Seasons, released yesterday on October 24th. Yay! Yay! If you hop onto my website, kimpatton.com, you'll be able to find the book in paperback, ebook, or you can order a signed copy and I will ship it right to your door. Okay, on with the show. Let's dive into the book. Today we are talking about, oh, wait a second, I'm not the host today. Who's the host today, Kevin? You are so corny. (laughs) You said we were winging it, <laughs> so that's what came out. Oh my goodness. We're talking about some book, <laughs> I guess, we found off the street. It's called Nothing Wasted, Struggling Well Through Difficult Seasons by Kim Patton. What? With a foreword by Jen Hesse. So Kevin is actually going to interview me and we're going to see how this goes. But I, (laughs) I prepped him on everything he needs to know and I'm giving him control. About time. (laughs) Okay. So what we're going to do is follow your said pattern of some introductory questions. And then I've chosen three chapters out of the book to talk through some themes, some major themes, and then we'll have a wrap up at the end um, with some final thoughts. So here's my first question, Kimberly. As you well know, this book has been in the works for many, many years, lots of additions and structures and different chapters and different stories. What makes you much more satisfied with this version of said book than previous versions and additions? That's a great question because a few of those versions I um, threw in the trash, as they say, because I did not love them. I always wanted to write something beautiful. I have read so many beautiful books and I just wanted to produce something that others would enjoy and something, honestly, that I would enjoy reading. And I knew in, in every version that I wrote while I was happy to get the details down on the page, while I was happy with the scenes that I was building, I was not happy because it was not beautiful. And I didn't figure out how to end each chapter. And I didn't know basically the common theme of the whole book, the subtitle, Struggling Well Through Difficult Seasons. I didn't land on that until this last draft that I wrote last November, December, January. Once I got done with that draft, I knew that because I had kind of started back from scratch, I just sat down and wrote those essays without consulting my manuscripts at all. (laughs) And there were many, many manuscripts I could have consulted to create a book. But I wanted to start from the very beginning. I wanted to rewrite and redo the whole book. And once I finished that draft, it took about two to three months I knew that I had written something beautiful and something that I could be proud of. And I knew that it was finally time to print the book. Because you actually proposed some of those earlier additions to publishers and agents. And they always said it wasn't quite good enough up to snuff because of X, Y, or Z. Do you think that this has better stories or better structure? We might be jumping the gun here a little bit. But because our story is kind of more rounded now, because we kind of have children and you can kind of see a trajectory of our life better in the midst of our story before, you didn't quite know where we were headed and you're in the middle of the struggle, stuff like that. Possibly. That's a really good point because this book spans almost 10 years. It starts in like 2000, 
11, 12. Okay, <laughs> my math is terrible because that's way more than 10 years. The book spans about 11 or 12 years, I guess. Um, the biggest thing that agents told me that helped me was that I needed to write to the reader. I couldn't just write a story for the sake of telling people what I wanted to tell them about my life. That wasn't good enough. So yeah, it wasn't up to snuff because I wasn't writing for a reader. And I remember Bob Hostetler, he said, you need to imagine yourself in a bookstore and the lady next to you is looking at your book. What is going to compel her to read your book? What does she need? What situation is she going home to after that? And he said, you have to meet the felt need. And everyone I talked to addressed that. What I was writing before was memoir. It was just stories from my life. But what they helped me with time figure out is how to write to someone and meet a need that that person is having right now. Yeah, there were some that wanted you just to write a devotional and add some scripture in there. And you, you're you still kicking the can against that one. <laughs> and yeah. All right. So your opening metaphor is something you don't truly love either. Sorry to throw your whole book under the bus, but you do too. Of You know, the overused metaphor of a flower or planting or gardening. I guess that's your contribution to North Georgia of having to have a garden, uh, of seed dying, being planted, breaking open and, and blossoming or flourishing. You know, I've read the book, obviously. Those last chapters, you still admit that you aren't entirely put together. Um, because you're very vulnerable in the book. So do you see this more of a cycle, more than a trajectory? Uh, are you obviously still growing? Like, where do you see the life of the flower going from here? Or are you just preparing for another book? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe all of my books will have the same su subtitle. Are you, are you saying I'm not a blossoming flower? <laughs> <laughs> of your own admission. True. The last few chapters talk about gratitude. So maybe I am coming full circle in the way of being more grateful, being more appreciative, being more aware of what's going on. Even in the struggle, I know that now I can offer my struggle to the Lord as a fragrant offering. That's something I talk about throughout the book. And also growth, noticing growth. It may not be about the flourishing beauty of a garden bursting with beautiful flowers. It may be about noticing how it started out as a bud and it's growing. I don't have to be perfect every day. I think maybe that's what I thought is that as you go through these difficult seasons, they end and then everything's fine. But what I'm finding is that the, the gems and the rewards are in the gratitude and getting to the end of the day and remembering the positive things like you kind of have reminded me of just, yes, we have hard moments. Yes, we have difficult days. But let's talk about and think about all the cool ways our girls are growing up and all of the cool things we got to do this weekend kind of thing. All right. So let's jump into some stories. Um, you have broken the book into three main sections, some chapters from when we lived in Dallas, Texas, some chapters when we lived in Florida, and then a few chapters at the end when we're in North Georgia. So I've selected one from each location. Uh, first one in Dallas, and the main theme here is marriage and leadership. You cover this in several chapters throughout the book. Just for the listeners, we're not going to talk about the stories in detail and ruin, you know, <laughs> all, all to talk about. But we'll give some general ideas. Okay, so the first story, we're in Dallas, Texas. Um, we're in seminary. We are playing with all of our friends. We're going to play some sports. And sort of wonderful time that was when we actually had couples as friends. And we got mm -hmm. to play sports every week. Mm -hmm. um, I miss that greatly. Yes. But this, this is a story that speaks to leadership and marriage because um, it wasn't, you know, a fight per se, but we had a disagreement um, <laughs> in the midst of a crowd uh, with our eyes even. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those where I'm trying to make decisions and you disagree mm -hmm. and that's okay. Why? How could you possibly disagree? Oh boy! With, Here we go with me. Oh boy! When I'm leading oh, a crowd of seminary people. Let me think about that. <laughs> Is that your question? 
so what's the dynamic there of having to have someone step up to make a decision when everyone's a full-grown adult and knows a decision has to be made? I knew that you and Josh, the t- the tall and gangly Josh, as I put in the book, and Kevin read that and said, he's not that tall. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, well, he felt he felt tall and gangly to me. And that's a good description. So that's what I'm going with. I knew you guys were capable. I just, I'm a, I have a strong opinion. And I think back in those years, I was 23, 24 years old. So I had a little bit of an attitude probably. Had? So trusting, it's it's about trust. Did I trust you and Josh to do what was best for the whole group? No, because I wanted something for myself and I knew that you guys were going to mess that up. So <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted was for us to play for as long as possible and for me to get playing time. I didn't want to be on the bench. Who wants to be a bench warmer? Not me. Well, so, there were about 30 people there. So if you can do math. So here's Kevin's logic. He sees that there's a problem to be solved, and he knows that somebody's going to have to solve it. He and Josh stood there, talked about it for a few minutes, weighed the options, and got ready to make a decision. And I was not patient. I was not trusting that they could figure out a solution that was best for everybody. I just wanted my own way. And so the lesson that I learned that day was important because it would set up for many years me stepping back and letting people make decisions who were slightly more capable and more informed and more level-headed. <laughs> well, here's here's more math of that the room was filling up and the longer we waited, the less we play. So this isn't about me and Josh being able to make a decision. Uh, because again, the room was full of very capable people. Um, it's just that we, I don't know. It's not even that we self delegated ourselves as the leaders. We just started counting, started dividing teams and got the night going. Um, but I chose this chapter, uh, because it was not the worst argument we ever had, (laughs) but it set the stage for, you know, other chapters in the book that do talk about. Uh, deeper arguments and disagreements where not that I had to be the one to make decisions, but there were situations that we had to trust each other. We had to communicate. We had to listen and, you know, does get into debates about egalitarian, complementarian, all that fun stuff that couples want to discuss today and churches want to split over. Again, how does that situation, as small as it is, develop our marriage down the road. There were so many big decisions to be made later that this was a lesson I think that God wanted to teach me early on because he knew that there was going to come times when Kevin and I would have to make decisions over infertility treatment, adoption, moving, selling houses, sickness, and I had to learn to I and I don't I don't even want to say I had to learn to submit because our our marriage is very much about mutual submission and mutual communication about everything. So we don't make decisions by ourselves. We make them together. But there is a sense of Kevin is wise and God has chosen him to lead our family. And so very specifically later on we might even talk about it today. Um he led our family into adoption before I felt like I was even ready. But his leadership is able to be trusted. And even in the small things like picking teams for a volleyball game, I did need to learn that I could set aside my desires, my selfish desires, and trust someone else to lead and guide because they are doing so with a pure heart. Was that the night where you sprained your ankle and I tried to pick you up and we both fell over <laughs> in front of everybody. Cause that was fun. Oh yeah. Did I, do you fell over? I picked you up and then we, I, and we fell, I over. fell over. Yeah. yeah. That no, was that was fun. a different night. So that oh, was okay. another volleyball night. He and Josh, same Josh carried me all the way to our the apartment store. across the street. 
you know, because the single storm was across the street. After we played for a couple hours, because... Yeah, but... You you got some ice. All right, here's a quote from that chapter (laughs) on page 57. What I learned, as in Kimberly learned, that night was the way leadership puts people in the spotlight. When the spotlight is shining, it's not all glory. Criticism, complaints, and whiners are always there to speak up. I'm thankful for leaders' ability to humbly guide us well. Moving on to our Florida chapter, and yes, this does transition to adoption well. It's the chapter where we are first entering the decision-making, the wandering, the confusion, um, probably because we were learning about our own infertility. So my first question is really, what do you remember about that season now looking back? Like, I know you could talk about it for days and days, but when you are, again, on the stool in the bathroom crying, what is going through your mind or what do you remember about that time period? I tell people these days that I was in denial for four years. So the first four years of our infertility journey from 2015 to 2019, I was in denial in the sense of I really felt like God was going to give us children and I was going to eventually get pregnant somehow or children were just going to come to us. When I had that breakdown in the handicap stall at the church, I was sitting on a toddler stool. I realized in that moment that it was not going to happen. It was not just going to come to me. I needed to do something. I think in that day, God switched my emotional state from denial to grief. And until a woman grieves her infertility, she may not be able to move forward with the next steps. And for a lot of women, their denial and their grief and their anger, it all is kind of, you know, it comes together, weaves in and out. But for me, my denial was so long and filled with just confusion and just waiting. I was just waiting. Of course, I can reference waiting and hope infertility ministry because that's what it is for a lot of women is they're just waiting for their children to come to them. But once I realized that it was probably not going to happen naturally, I needed to grieve that. And so I actually grieved pretty quickly because I, I was ready. And once I grieved and once I really came face to face with, you know what, we're going to have to grow our family a different way. I was then ready to begin looking at those options, which were foster and adoption or medical treatment. To me, it's really clear now where I was emotionally, but back then it was very confusing and I was just kind of sitting around waiting until one day I said, okay, it's time to get to work. Let's go. Let's go get our children. Yeah, here's a quote from a chapter on infertility, page 108. It says, I wanted to forget about what was broken in my body. At that point, I didn't just want to be a mother no matter how. I was still clinging to my plans, my dreams, my way of doing things. And I kind of knew that about you. So when I'm sitting in the hallway at church and see a poster for an event about adoption or foster care, uh, I pretty much assumed that we would want to go. (laughs) Uh, Silly me, apparently you weren't quite ready for that. <laughs> so when I told you about it, what what was going through your head? No? I was like, no. <laughs> That's what was going through my head. It was sad. It was sad to me. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go and be exposed to something that would make me confront my infertility. But it wasn't like... The typical husband trying to solve every problem. I really thought this was what we were going to do because we both wanted to grow our family. So, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Seven years later. Oh, it's uh, okay. But we did go. You were good about it, though. You were really nice to me. So that helped. Yeah, I remember sitting in the car before we go. And I don't know if we prayed, but we took a breath. And I knew you were anxious. And we said, "Let's, let's do it together. And we took it slow. We got through the opening ceremony. Yeah, and we won't talk about that day too much because I think it's in the book. But quickly, what was your response or thoughts? What what switched in your brain after the conference? I think you already touched on it a little bit, but what switched for you after that? 
I remember one of the dads, he was a foster dad. They had adopted many kids and his picture was on the screen. He and his wife and all their kids. And they came from all different backgrounds. And so his family was beautiful. He got up on the stage and told his story. And I remember he was balding and he was not attractive. <laughs> and he, he said that. He's like, I don't need to pass my genes on to anybody. We're, we're good here. And so he was happy to choose adoption. And while that was a very lighthearted joke, I thought, hey, that's kind of cool. Do Kevin and I need to pass our genes on to our kids? I didn't have an intense desire to have biological kids. I had an intense desire to get pregnant. So that may sound like the same thing, but it's not. Because um, when I heard him tell his story, I thought, yeah. That makes sense. There's other kids out there who need parents. Listening to people share their stories really helped me know that this is a this is a valid and wonderful option. And look at them. Look at them on the screen. Look at their beautiful family. Look at that happy, bald dad. <laughs> All he right. really was ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I don't pass on my genes either. Aw. <clears throat> yeah, our, our girls are... Much more beautiful. Beautiful. Than... <laughs> yes. Spoiler alert. We adopted and we have children. In case you didn't know that from her writing and posting. So moving on to our time in Georgia. We've been here for about a year and a half now. Thus only the few chapters in the book. So we're moving to a chapter that I cannot talk about. Both to not give the story away and because it's kind of difficult to talk about. But the theme is about protecting children and living in fear and how to be a good parent, uh, all kind of wrapped up in one. There's a spectrum, I think, of approaches to parenting. You can be a helicopter, um, you can wrap in bubble wrap, um, or you can be a free range, you know, all the way through. And Kim and I are not on the same level of that spectrum. Um, so what... Talk about your approach in parenting on, on the safety scale. Um, well, just as an example, yesterday we were at a pumpkin patch with friends and it was just the girls and I and the girls were climbing up a hill and there were roots on the hill and there was dirt, obviously it's a hill and grass and they were climbing up and then climbing down a different part and Shiloh is two and Eden is three and Eden did it pretty well. She got up to the top and she kind of slid down on her bottom and she was happy and I wasn't really worried. But then Shiloh started climbing up and she got to the top and I'm standing at the bottom of the hill and the top of the hill is probably a good, I don't know, 20, 25 feet up high. And then I thought, how is this little child going to get down the hill? Is she going to go on her bottom? Is she going to, is she going to go on her belly and kind of climb down and she did it the way the other kids were doing it and halfway through I thought oh what if she tumbles but I stood at the bottom I cheered her I cheered all the kids on and I didn't once climb up the hill to help them I just watched and I let them struggle same thing on the playground if they can climb up as high as they can then they can climb back down or if they can climb the stairs and go down that big old slide, then they can do it. I would like them to do hard things. I would like them to feel capable and strong. And if they can't do it, I would like them to, them to try to figure out a way to keep going and not give up. So my safety radar is pretty low because I'm always thinking, okay, if they fall from that height, it's not that far. If they fall from this height, okay, it's a little bit is a little bit higher, but I would like to be a little bit hands off and I'd rather talk them through it and let them feel the power of accomplishing something on their own because I find that they are really proud of themselves when they see that they can do it. And that comes from your dad's influence of, you know, if something happens, we can figure it out. Yeah, they're fine. They're fine taking Advil. <laughs> and both of my parents were, were pretty, like they let us do... They let us 
be rascally with the, you know, backyard and all that stuff. So in some cases, I would I wish I were a little bit more of a helicopter parent because I get myself into scary situations. Don't mention anything, Kevin. But I freak myself out sometimes because I'm like, oh, my word, what if what if something happens and it's my fault? And so but that's not my natural bend. My natural bend is to give them freedom. Well, down the road, that's going to help their problem solving. You know, if they get into a situation, they'll remember past events where, you know, mom was either there to help me think through something or I figured it out myself and et cetera. But this also rolls over into not just physical things, but, you know, mental battles they'll face or things with friends or, you know, emotional scars they'll have. Our mutual approach is to not protect them from everything and shield them and we want to help walk them through something not shield them yes you would agree with that yes absolutely and why is that our approach when the babies were newborns one thing that's really hard for mamas is letting go of them at night to sleep it's really easy to just kind of hover and watch the monitor and monitor their breathing there's all kinds of products on the market that monitor your baby at all times. And so you don't have to freak out because you know they're breathing, you know their heart is beating, you know that they're okay. Early on, I valued sleep like most new parents do. And I had to, at night, train my mind and my body to give my babies to God before I went to sleep because I could stay up and watch them. I could go in and check on them, but I did not want to live in fear So I had to give my babies to God because I said, okay, they're sleeping. I trust you to take care of them. And I actually had to confront the reality of what if something terrible happens to my girls? What if I lose the babies I love most in this world? It's not fun to think about that. But if you can confront that and say, okay, God, they're not mine anyway. Honestly, in our situation, they're God's first because he is con- in control of all life. They're their birth mother's second because she gave them life. And then they're ours third. I tried to set myself up for relinquishing my rights pretty early on and relinquishing my power and control over their safety. And it has been tested many times, like last week or a couple months ago or a year ago or at birth when Shiloh was in the NICU. It has been tested over and over again. Whose kids are these and who do they belong to? And I have to relinquish that control or I'll go crazy. Yeah, we've we've learned many times that, of course, you take precautions and of course you are wise and make good decisions and give them everything they need. But at the end of the day, mm-hmm. the world is crazy mm-hmm. and we are really powerless. Um, and I even figured out in hospice as a chaplain like we always people always want to ask me how longer how much longer do I have and we can't predict that so we just say you know I can't tell you and you could outlive me because I could die on the way home I have no power over life um so it's the same thing with kids we can protect them but ultimately they are gods like you said um and so before we wrap up I I've always, I don't know if I told you this back then on that day, but I want to make it public for the radio (laughs) and all things. Um, We could have infinite disagreements. You may annoy me to death on certain days. Wow. (laughs) But uh, our daughter (laughs) wouldn't be alive if it weren't for you. And so thank you. Oh. Very much. <laughs> You're welcome. You saved her. Oh. Was that loud enough for the microphone? <laughs> Thanks, babe. Here's your quote. <clears throat> Page 193. Our lives are a gift. The edge is there, threatening on certain days to tip our loved ones over. To love is to risk and sometimes lose. To love is to kiss the divine, sometimes bitter sometimes sweet so to wrap up uh we talked about several themes about 
marriage and communication. And uh, the key there is just to trust one another because things are going to happen um, that we think we can control, but we can't. So setting those patterns of good um, habits in place are always good. Um, there's gonna, we're going to struggle for many, many years over different things, but I think your subtitle is very, very good. Struggling well and always falling forward, always making sure you're moving forward, and then making good decisions, wise decisions, um, but knowing that ultimately you're not in control. Whether you believe in a higher power or a god or a deity, whatever, but something something's much higher in control than us weak and frail humans. So thank you for finishing this book. Thank you for getting it done. <laughs> <laughs> because I know it's harder on you, but I have lived... <laughs> I've lived not only the events, but I've lived the writing of this thing. So thank you for getting it published. Yes. Any final comments and words? Well, thank you for sticking <laughs> sticking with me. I, I tortured him day after day with, I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to do that. And I'm going to cut this whole chapter. And what about this? And what do you think? And read this. Read this whole manuscript. He read the whole manuscript at least three or four times. Every edition. To help me. And I mean... There was a lot of work that needed to be done, period. But I needed a lot of mindset shifts because it took me a while to get to this book. And throughout all of those years were tiny shifts. So what I would say to any writer is don't give up. If God has laid something on your heart to write, then please write it because you're not going to feel you're going to feel better when you write it and get it out, get it down on paper work on it, craft it, edit it, and then figure out how you want to release it or not release it into the world. For me, I knew those previous editions were not ready for the world to read. And as badly as I wanted the book to be done, my pride was such that I had to do it right and I had to make it good. And until I felt good about it, I wasn't going to torture the world with those (laughs) manuscripts. So you're welcome, world, for not publishing until it was really ready. Thank you for interviewing me for my book. You're welcome. Anytime. I'll be around, as always. (laughs) Thank you for listening to another episode of Book Therapy. Today we talked about Nothing Wasted, Struggling Well Through Difficult Seasons by Kim Patton. Once again, the book is on my website, kimpatton.com. The editions are paperback, ebook. And if you want a signed copy, I would be so thrilled to get an order from you, write you a little message in the front of the book, and mail it to your doorstep. All right, see you next time. They're the birth mothers first. They're the ones who gave them life. And then they are... No, that's not true. (laughs)